right now, but that's okay. Just about to be on YouTube. Right now, right now, that's okay. Just about to be on YouTube. Okay. All right. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you to those of you attending as attendees over there. Um, and especially thank you to our five panelists this evening. Um, we're really excited tonight to have a, um, a look at something that people think about, I think, pretty often, but don't always get a chance to sort of get directly in connection with here in Ballard, which is our um, maritime community, especially our maritime uh, commercial and uh, industrial community. Um, folks on the waterfront uh, have for a long time been really the central engine of the economy of Ballard. Uh, so we thought tonight that we would try and dive into that topic um, with a panel of folks with a variety of relationships to the um, maritime business community and the maritime industry here in Ballard. Um, so welcome all of you. Um, welcome to those of you who are joining us. Um, this also is the first meeting we wanted to do something we haven't been doing, which is just um, provide a, a brief land acknowledgement, uh, seeming especially appropriate tonight, given the role of um, the waterfront in this meeting. So I uh, want to note that Ballard District Council respectfully acknowledges that the greater Ballard area is on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people. We honor with gratitude these lands and waters, which have been cared for by the Duwamish, Suquamish, and Muckleshoot people, past and present. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to have two halves of the meeting basically this evening. Um, the first half, uh, we've asked each of our um, notable panelists to uh, just spend a few minutes uh, talking about their role, some of their history, some of their experience, their relationship to this, this uh, subject of um, kind of writ large um, maritime industrial ballad. Um, and to talk a little bit about some of the uh, issues and challenges and opportunities, I guess, that folks see. Um, we decided on an order of speakers that's, uh, I will say, right from the start, just arbitrary. We're going to um, hear from each of the folks, and then we'll spend kind of the remainder of the meeting trying to have a panel discussion with um, questions from the Valor District Council Board and from um, folks who have emailed us and from any of you who are attending the meeting who just want to put your hand up. And, uh, and we'll try and call on you when that time comes sort of later in the meeting. Um, and did I forget anything? You're muted now. No, I think that sounds great. Thank you. All right, great. So um, I see that he's driving. If you want to go later in the order, Mr. Dixon, I'd be happy to. You want to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down on that? Uh, OK, so we'll, we'll skip you for a moment, and I'll go. Um, uh, first to um, Warren Akervik. Uh, Warren is a longtime friend of Ballard District Council, um, former president of the Ballard District Council some decade or so ago, um, certainly is one of the icons of Ballard, uh, and the former president and retired owner of Ballard Oil. Uh, Ballard Oil focuses their business on serving the Pacific Northwest and Alaskan fishing fleets with diesel fuel, lubricants, oils, filters, many other related supplies. They also have a full service heating oil delivery department that covers much of the greater Seattle area um, and have been on the ship canal just east of Ballard Locks uh, since the year 1937. Warren, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm working. Yeah, I, I've been pushing the no mute button, so I'm, I'm off. You're on. You're on. I'm, I'm on. I'm not off. OK. Some of the other things that, uh, you know, I, I actually was born in Seattle and I have to qualify it. I've, I've lived inside the Seattle city limits, current Seattle city limits my whole life. But when I started north of 85th was not in Seattle, it was out of Seattle. So I got to watch it be annexed. I think it was about 1952 or somewhere in there, up a long ways, long time ago. But anyway, uh, I've, I've enjoyed this community. I love the city. Uh, I would do anything for it. I've, uh, some of the things that I've worked on is uh, I just have my list of good stuff. Um, you know, I worked for Alaska Waste Viaduct Stakeholders Committee, uh, SDOT Freight Advisory Committee when it was just an advisory committee, then it became a board. And so I've been on the board. 
I think I was supposed to be off for a couple of years, but they couldn't get rid of me because I felt there was so much that needed to be understood about freight mobility. So I was on the freight board. Uh, Manufacturing Industrial Council of Seattle, I've been in that ever since uh, since 2000, actually. Uh, executive board for the old BINMIC, Ballard Interbay Manufacturing Industrial Center. Uh, board of Directors, Seattle Marine Business Coalition, member of North Seattle Industrial Association, Seattle Freight Advisory Board, I said earlier, and actually I spent some time in ST3 stakeholders going to meetings trying to decide what would work best for everybody for the city for the ST3 if we ever get enough money and it can actually work by was it supposed to be 2035, but I think that's going to be pushed out a little bit. Um, I've been active in the industry, uh, like I say, ever since I was born. I remember coming down on the docks down here and the, the old wooden planks, uh, there's always about a half to a three quarter inch gap between the wooden planks. And I thought when I was a kid, I remember holding my mom's hand and I thought that I could fall through those little cracks if I walked down that dock. So I stepped in the middle of the planks and made sure I was exactly centered on the dock so I wouldn't fall in. And uh, having lived that experience and uh, back in the old days, uh, it wasn't uncommon to have six or seven new boats in every morning we'd fuel. And a lot has changed since then. We still have a very, very vibrant fishing industry. Um, I've got a grandson coming back. He should be just about Nia Bay right now. I just checked a couple hours earlier and he was just off Nia Bay. He's been fishing Pollock up in Alaska since uh, January and uh, he'll be back uh, for a short stint. And then he's uh, off to go Bristol Bay fishing. Uh, if he wasn't, he would go and hake off the coast, which opens up on May 15th. Uh, he'd be fishing Bristol Bay for uh two or three months uh, july and, uh, and august actually uh and then he'll be back again and ready to go back up for bee season and pollock so he uh he likes so many of the fishermen it's, it's kind of ironic when we talk about the fishing industry people believe that when they see the boats here that's it that's all that happens well every one of these boats is actually about another thousand fifteen hundred businesses in the city of seattle they're not really licensed here uh, the only license they have is going out and literally risking their lives to bring back, you know, a million or $2 million to us and the families tend to spend around the area. So the economic benefit is dramatic, but they're really not seen. I always tell people when I look at pictures of Fisherman's Terminal, I can see by the way and the, where the boats are, what time of year it is, because in July is the very best time. There's no boats there. They're all out bringing millions back to us. And in December, they're all there no money is coming back. So I'm very proud to serve the maritime industry for the benefit of this community. And uh, I'd like to see it stay here. So for right now, I guess that's pretty much it, unless there's anything else I should be saying. Well, I just wonder how things are going now, Do you, you know, giving a little bit of reflection on, on sort of the current times um, <laughs> for, from a perspective of Ballard Oil, from your perspective as a, as a lifelong um, Ballardite, um, down on the waterfront, how's it going? What are the challenges? What are the things that are going well? I think the biggest challenges we have is the community. I mean, I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, but it's a lack of an educated community that really realize what this industry, this distant water fisheries brings. You hear so much advertising, fishing is dead. There's no more fish. They've overfished everything. This is the highest controlled uh, amount of fishing that's done. Uh, the North Pacific is very, very uh, sustainable in the amount of fish that it has and what fisheries are. COVID uh, affected it. Uh, guys couldn't get off their boats and stuff, but it had an impact. But I think the biggest impact is actually gentrification and the movement of the community down into the what I call the shoreline, the industrial area, and the impacts that it has on land use. I mean, we have a maritime and, and industrial land use group going on right now. I think the land use and the impacts, uh, the noise ordinance, which uh, is at the property line. So a lot of companies are getting closed down in times when it gets noisy, when these shipyards are working. And the other is the transportation. We watch and consistently watch transportation get compromised. And there's a real lack of understanding. Um, I've got a freight board meeting coming up next Tuesday morning. And in there, I'm actually gonna take one of the videos that I have and show what it's like to be in a truck and what you have to do in a big truck. So we're getting compromised all the time. There's a Route 40 uh, change that they want to make. And one of those changes that they put on the Route 40 bus would put a curb bulb right where the truck has to turn to take the groceries to the QFC on 24th and uh, 
57th. And so it won't be able to get in that route. And I'm not sure how they'll get in. I can probably figure it out. But when you're driving a big WB 67, it's a 67 foot truck, which is 67 foot wheelbase. It's a little difficult to get around. And as we see more and more routes compromised and more and more squeeze on those corridors, it uh, becomes more and more challenging. So those, um, you know, we put in a 30 million gallon tank here, or they're putting it in the, the big dig, I call it, uh, for storage of stormwater and sewage. Uh, the Lake Washington Ship Canal is, people call this place Salmon Bay, and I really try to refrain from that. This is the Lake Washington Ship Canal. It's a drainage ditch, if you will, for the Cedar River watershed. There's a large, large flow of water. It has uh, been compromised by all the... Uh, sewage and stuff that's run down from an overflows and now it's getting really cleaned up but uh, we, we can't even run a garden hose in the water without be breaking the violation so an awful lot of uh, things are happening that uh, and regulations and stuff that I think if the public really understood there, there's just so many things I can't even start to get into it but yeah I keep on fighting thanks Warren um I appreciate you're kind of highlighting a number of those challenges um in the context of that, it, it may be really appropriate or maybe a little unfair of me to segue to um, my friend and our guest, Sarah Scherer. Um, but I think it's an appropriate kind of time for Sarah to um, join us too. Sarah is um, former um, director of the Seattle Maritime Academy right here in Ballard, um, teaching folks how to safely do all kinds of work aboard boats and ships. Um, but has more recently moved on to a role um, with the uh, Seattle Office of Economic Development. Um, and uh, she can speak really to some of the economic resilience of the maritime community and the industrial community. Um, but I think we'll also be able to talk a little bit about how the city is trying to develop strategies to ensure the industrial and maritime future as well and the protection of uh, the industrial maritime sector in the context of some of the problems that that Warren pointed out, um, which are necessarily, for the most part, just a result of the you know really rapid growth we're seeing here in Ballard. So, um, Sarah, really want to say thank you for when you were here before. It was super fat, fun and interesting, and really appreciate you joining us again tonight. And uh, thanks. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, I was the dean of Seattle Maritime Academy for uh, four years and four and a half, maybe, I don't know. So was in the Ballard area most of that time and um, have been in and out of Seattle since the early nineties um, and have always been loved being around Ballard. So I've kind of watched it grow and change um, and shift over the years. Um, in terms of what the city um, is doing right now, uh, Warren mentioned a lot of the maritime and industrial strategy process, which is a land use process, but um, you can't really talk about land use and, and protecting um, the industrial sectors and that land without talking about uh, workforce. And without, if you're talking about workforce, you can't talk about you can't not talk about transportation because how do we get these workers to that location? Um, you also have to talk about in the manufacturing industrial areas right now, we have to talk about public safety. As the Dean of Seattle Maritime Academy, I can speak personally of the depth and breadth as I'm sure a lot of you can of the um, public safety issues in uh, the manufacturing areas in, in Ballard. It was really tough on a daily basis. Um, I spent, I don't know, at least a half hour of my time every single morning filling out find it, fix it apps. So, and um, calling the cops for, for different reasons. So um, there's public safety issues. There's also environmental equity issues when you talk about land use. Um, so there's all these different layers that, that, um, that are combined um, around land use because we want to protect this land because these are the jobs that provide us with middle wage careers. So if we in Seattle, we have a lot of jobs that are low paying jobs, service jobs, and we have a lot of 
high tech hospital or um, high tech and hospital type jobs or medical jobs that are high paid. So we've lost this middle wage, this um, middle place in Seattle for workforce. So part of my job as the manufacturing and maritime advocate to the Office of Economic Development is to try and make sure that we have the land, the companies to provide these middle wage jobs. Um, and in COVID, of course, uh, a lot of these uh, disparities and disproportional effect to BIPOC and women, particularly, uh, we want to make space for that in these middle wage jobs. So that's what we spend a lot of time doing. And then on the side of that, um, I spend a lot of time talking to Warren and uh, Eugene and lots of other people and Doug Dixon um, and folks over at a lot of the maritime companies helping them with specific issues around uh, permitting, um, freight movement, um, uh, Uncruise is having a problem right now with uh, a state ban um, on small cruise vessels. So we do a lot of little piecemeal things on things like permitting and trucking and West Seattle Bridge and all kinds of stuff. So Good. that's basically that's what I do. That's your finger in a lot of different places in the, in I the, do. In the business. So that should provide for a lot of good um, conversation about some of the challenges and solutions here in a little bit. Um, with that, I think I'll move down the line. I don't know if, I think we still have Doug, but he's um, camera off right now, maybe trying to get somewhere where he can join us more successfully. So um, maybe next we'll go to Russell Shrewsbury. Russell is the vice president of Western Tobo which is a Ballard family owned business uh, since the year 1948. Uh, Western Towboat has grown to a fleet of 22 tugs and seven barges now serving the Puget Sound to the Aleutian Islands, uh, from Arctic Alaska to the Hawaiian Islands and to the Panama Canal. Uh, Western Towboat is based on Northwest 40th Street down by the Ship Canal, uh, and they provide customers with one of the most modern custom built and designed tug and barge fleets on the entire West Coast. Um, Russell, it's really helpful and appreciated that you made time to be with us tonight as one of the you know, central critical businesses right down on the water. Hey, thank you. Appreciate that. I'm a third generation mariner, uh, also a tugboat captain, and uh, business is now run by my father, myself, and uh, my brother and sister. Um, my dad and my brother and I are all captains still and uh, still run our vessels here and around Puget Sound when I'm not tied to a desk chair, <laughs> but um, yeah, we've been in business since 1948. Um, my grandfather, he worked at FOSS before starting our company. And at the time it was two weeks on, two weeks off. And he decided that, well, I want to work a little more than that. So he went and bought his own tug and started towing logs and uh, sand and gravel around Puget Sound. Uh, we've been towing sand and gravel for Salmon Bay Cement Company since about, I think, 1956. And uh, so that's kind of been our longest running contract for what we do. Um, and as, as our business has grown over the years, we decided to start building tugboats uh, for ourselves in 1980 at our yard in Ballard. Mm. And I always kind of give people the uh, analogy, the, w the way we build a tug in Ballard is, is how people at the restaurants go the farm to table, right? So we're constructing this tug with local materials, uh, steel from Everett, Seattle, Seaport Steel. Uh, we're getting parts from Ballard Hardware uh, or in Ballard Industrial now and all the outlying suppliers um, that are in and around Ballard. So it's really a combined effort of the community of all these industrial businesses that help us continue our, uh, our business. Uh, we're supplying tugs with anything you can name it. I mean, food and parts and vendors. And uh, most of that, the majority is coming from the Seattle area. And we're on a quick turnaround. We're, we're towing freight to Alaska for uh, Alaska Marine Lines. So we uh, generally are having, oh, about four, week, four boats a week that go from Ballard to Alaska every week, year round. And uh, it's really important that we have that support from our community. Our, our challenges, like Sarah said, are uh, it's people. Um, finding the right people to do the job, qualified people. And 
we look at the high schools and uh, my former high school, I went to school in Shorewood and Shoreline. They got rid of a wood shop and I think auto shop. And uh, we're trying to get people back into the mindset of the skilled trades. And I've been on the helping with the maritime high school that they're trying to put together here in Seattle. And uh, we also been really happy to have the support of Seattle Maritime Academy, uh, taking a lot of these young folks that a lot of them are local to come work on the boats and move them up through our ranks. And it's also, as Warren said, um, people don't really understand the amount of industry that supports what we do, what the fishermen do. Uh, that's right in Ballard. There is a ton of businesses. I mean, uh, when you look at uh, all the hydraulic providers, fittings and the hardware stores and uh, just, I mean, we buy all our groceries at QFC there on 85th or Fred Meyer, I guess now, but it's uh, just a ton of support from the community that really makes our business go. And we have about 180 people right now that come and go from the tugs. And um, But we're happy to be in Ballard. Uh, the other issues that kind of hinder and hurt our business would be uh, like a manufacturing tax. So whenever we build a new tugboat, we're getting taxed on top of the tax for the parts and everything we buy. Uh, we're worried about land use uh, being pushed out of being able to build a tug in Seattle. And we've spent a significant amount of capital to clean our storm water and everything else we have to do for the city. Um, but we want to continue building tugs. We have a l- more plans to build more tugs and uh, we don't want to move our operation. And uh, so you have you know, ownership and control of enough land, but, but it's just other challenges that are making it hard to do that there. It, it, it can be. Yeah. And um, the way our property runs is there's a street end that runs right through the middle of our yard. So uh, we can't control access to our yard, which is, cost us a lot of money in public safety. We've had, you know, numerous times in the last three years where we've had welding leads stolen, people cutting locks on our stuff, where some of the other businesses have a, you know, able to lock in their yard. We, we can't do that where we are. Mm-hmm. We have security, but it's, it's, it's been tough. Um, a lot of vandalism and, uh, but, and it's an industrial era. We, we kind of expect that, but I think in the last five years, it's, it's gotten a lot worse. Um, when I was a kid, grow, I grew up on the tugs. And we used to swim in front of our yard and hang a crane over with a fishing buoy on it and swim in the canal. I don't think I would ever let my kids do that. But we find hypodermic needles, garbage. It's not like it was uh, 30 years ago when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. But Interesting. Great. Well, that, again, um, that's... Uh, material for a lot of good follow-up questions. I think when we get into a panel discussion, I want to keep rolling through some introductions and get to know everyone here a little bit and make opening statements. Um, I'll keep pushing Doug, even though it looks like he's moved into the passenger seat. I'll move him to last and um, move on to Stephanie Jones Stebbins, who we're happy to join us tonight, is the managing director of the Port of Seattle Maritime. Uh, With more than 19 years as a port employee, Stephanie is responsible for directing the strategic and daily operations of the fishing and commercial operations and the cruise operations, the grand terminal operations, and the recreational boating and industrial properties and marine maintenance. I think you need a few more programs under you, Stephanie. (laughs) Um, She has led the strategic planning efforts to develop a vision and long-term plan for fishermen terminal as well, and the port works to make our... I think everyone knows that the port works to make our local maritime industries regionally and globally competitive while also focusing the investments towards environmental and community health. Stephanie, thanks very much for being here this evening. Yeah, thank you. And uh, it's, it's kind of fun to go after all these other uh, um, folks who I've, who I've known for, for so long. And thanks for doing this. I actually live in Ballard. And one thing I will say is I'm always surprised, like right here on the water, how few people here really know about the maritime industry. So this is great to do. Yeah, we felt like this was so overdue for that very reason. I mean, we all sort of see all these businesses and signs. Some of us who are mariners appreciate kind of the recreational piece, some other pieces. But I think for the most part, it's this great kind of industrial identity that we all really identify with the aesthetics and the kind of history about it, but don't really necessarily know a hell of a lot about it. So. Thank you all. Please continue. 
Yeah, well, and, and one thing that I, I try to focus on, you know, we think very nostalgically about the history. It's really also uh, a really important part of our future. And, um, you know, a couple years ago, the port of Seattle and Tacoma formed a joint venture to handle all our cargo together. So we now have kind of one joint cargo operation. And one thing that did is it left, that is such a huge operation. It really left the folks at the port to focus on the other maritime businesses and what we really need to do to grow the whole industry and sustain it uh, in the face of all the issues we've heard about with, with land use, transportation, the cost of living, et cetera, gentrification. Uh, so a couple big areas that I think about when I, when I just think about the future here in S Seattle uh, really, the maritime business needs to, I think, really um, focus on sustainability, on equity, and bringing new folks into the business, and on innovation. We are really unique here in Seattle to have a maritime industry and actually a, a high-tech industry. Not many places in the world have that, so there's a real opportunity for um, innovation. So we are, and it's interesting, we have kind of visited innovation centers in other parts of the world uh, before we started our own plans for an innovation center. And I remember walking into uh, the uh, accelerator in um, Rotterdam and there were two businesses from Seattle that couldn't find startup resources here. So they actually had to go to Europe to find folks to provide venture capital, et cetera. So the port uh, is actually creating um, Maritime Innovation Center at Fisherman's Terminal, which is really uh, the premier um, uh, maritime industrial property that the port has in Seattle. We also, in Ballard, I mean, we also have a Shilshol, which is more focused on recreational, which I think everyone probably knows about. Um, and at Fisherman's Terminal, which has been really the, the home of the North Pacific fishing fleet, but also maritime uh, port maritime property since uh, 1914, so about 106 years. The oldest building there is the uh, ship supply building, which will be um, converted to a maritime innovation center. And there really the focus is to bring, uh, to help businesses, to help startups, to bring innovation, partnering with uh, University of Washington, other academia also, um, the uh, State uh, Department of Commerce, Maritime Blue is an important partner. That building, we are actually at about 60% design and it should be completed in uh, 2020, end of 2023, beginning of 2024. While that happens, we have started uh, with Maritime Blue uh, an accelerator. So this is, there's not a building yet, but doing it, um, but creating like a virtual, which actually this happened even before COVID and now it turns out this is what everybody's doing anyway, but actually a, a virtual accelerator where startup comp maritime startup companies will, they apply, they go through this mentorship program, get exposed to venture capitalists. We last year, a cohort of 11 uh, small uh, maritime startups went through, they actually uh, generated, I think, $70 million of venture capital. We now are in our second uh, second cohort of 11 uh, companies doing all kinds of things, a lot of environmental related um, things, um, digitalization, sustainability. So it's, it's really uh, some innovating companies and also much more diverse. We've got, I think, four women-owned companies, a number of companies owned by people of color. So it's also helping diversify the industry. So in the middle of our second cohort of businesses right now, um, and you know, I could go on, but I'm gonna stop there because I know there's questions, but those are just a couple of the things we're really focused on to, in the maritime industry. I could also talk about Cruise, not so much happening there right now, uh, but we hope to be restarting before too long. And um, I just certainly support the comments I've heard from, from 
from Warren, Russell, Sarah about the challenges to the maritime industry right now. Yeah, and in the context of the programming and sort of uh, new things you just mentioned, it'll be, I think, a real interesting conversation here in a few minutes to try and talk about how, how we can make these things join or how you all are trying to make them join and work. Um, I want to introduce our last panelist before we get into more of a, a discussion. Um, and, and he is Doug Dixon. Um, Doug is, of course, longtime general manager of Pacific Fisherman Shipyard, one of the most important maritime businesses in Ballard, right down on the corner of 24th and near Market, just kind of down behind the new, gigantic new um, residential building that's going up down there on the corner of 24th and Market. Uh, Pacific Fisherman, if you don't know, was founded in 1946 by 400 Norwegian heritage fishermen as a co-op style shipyard. Um, and then Pacific Fisherman Shipyard and PFI Marine Electric became heavily involved in Pacific Northwest Alaska fishing industry and in bringing their expertise to the commercial passenger workboat and large yacht sectors with dry docks and repowering. So that's what Pacific Fisherman does under Doug's tutelage. Uh, he knows kind of everything about Maritime Ballard. Doug, thanks for being with us. Yes, thank you. It's been a shipyard uh, on that site since 1871. So wow. we're, we're celebrating this year the 150th anniversary of that and uh, also the uh, 75th anniversary of uh, Pacific Fishman. Uh, uh, back in the day, they built steam uh, boats for Joshua Green and uh, the world's largest uh, tug for the uh, Hawaiian Tug and Barge. And then the first of the Mickey Mickey class um, uh, tugs for the Army. Uh, 68, one of them were built uh, um, across the United States for the war effort. And also for the war effort, they built 16 um, minesweeps, sub chasers, and patrol craft. Two of them today are still pretty famous. One's uh, John Wayne's Wild Goose, and the other's uh, Jacques Cousteau's Calypso. After that, they went on to um, when the fishermen took over um, and built a lot of uh, uh, fish boats, of course, uh, starting in wood, but progressing to uh, steel. Um, uh, 16 of the King Crab vessels were built uh, there, um, and uh, but now it's mostly a repair yard. And it is uh, uh, both old school, uh, the old shipwrights, the corkers that keep the wood boats afloat. We have the Virginia 5 in there right now for a major refit, but we're also uh, rather high tech, uh, 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 both in boats. We uh, service a majority of all the uh, high speed aluminum craft and their water jets. Uh, and we also, uh, when we acquired uh, Lundy Electric, uh, we got a, a, a panel shop that's a UL approved 508 uh, panel that does uh, sophisticated controls for uh, conveyors and other process machinery on fish boats primarily, but also Starbucks and Theo's chocolates. And we uh, program uh, uh, logical computers that, that, that uh, govern all these things. Uh, so uh, we're a, a mix of all that. I personally, uh, uh, 20 years ago when I came to uh, be the caretaker for Packfish, um, uh, also started up the youth uh, YMTA, the Youth Maritime uh, Training Association, and we established the Ballard uh, Maritime Academy at, um, at Ballard High School, which is still uh, thriving today, uh, despite uh, all the issues with COVID and, and reduced uh, what they call CTEs and all these other things, uh, they're still cranking kids out on the maritime. Uh, and uh, so workforce development is a big thing with us. We've uh, been in 20 or 30 different internship programs uh, through the years, and, and it, it's very important. Uh, Sarah talks about workforce development, and that's no joke. It's, it's got to happen in order for our industry to survive. So uh, with that, uh, I've said enough. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you, all of you, for those thoughts and opening comments. Um, we're gonna try and keep this pretty casual. I'm just trying to um, foment a good conversation about topics like um, past and present. I'm gonna join um, oh. I'm gonna go ahead and mute Doug while he figures out. Yeah, please do. Transportation planning there. Um, uh, first, we wanted to um, just ask a few questions that we sort of had as, uh, as sort of initial prompting questions, and we've been having pretty good success in our monthly meeting with me kind of running the video show and Angie jumping in with some of the questions and, and coordinating some of that. So I'm going to let her join in now to um, just lead us in that direction, and then I'll try and facilitate as much as possible. 
Sounds great. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, one of the first questions we had was touched on by some of all of your comments, I think, but we were curious to just um, dig a little bit more into what is it that's special about Ballard for this line of work? You know, sometimes you hear people asking, well, why can't this happen in Everett or Tacoma? Or what is unique about Ballard? And um, some of you have spoken to why, you know, what you hope the future here holds. But I was just curious to get a few more comments about you know, the geography or the community. Um, I'm going to call on Warren first, but I think you're muted. Oh, there we go. Oh, I, I figured that out. You're supposed to undo it. Yeah, you're <laughs> I, an ace, I think the most important thing is the government locks. You know, like I say, this used to be Salmon Bay, which is just kind of a, a mud hole that they used to put a lot of logs in. In fact, when the tide went out, the logs were high and dry. When the tide came in, the logs were going in the sawmills. Well, when they put the locks in, they made the man man-made channel and when you stop and look at Seattle, I look at the shipyards. There's eight shipyards in the city of Seattle and seven of them that, as far as I'm concerned, the ones that can haul the 100-foot boats, there's seven of them on the Lake Washington Ship Canal. So, when, and the the other the other one left is the one down in uh, the old Todd Shipyard down there. It's, uh, I, mean, I can't think of the name of it right now, but uh, we know it's there. But I mean, this is where it is all housed. This is where a lot of the hydraulics, the electrical shops, the panel shops, all the support industries that support that fleet are right here in the Lake Washington Ship Canal, and, and the primary, the majority of them are up here in Ballard, and there's, you know, still some left around Lake Union, but obviously it's getting gentrified and, and a lot of change down there, but it's still here in Ballard, and it's very, very focal. There was a, uh, uh, we talk of the uh, the missing link, and uh, I forget, Peggy Stewart, I think, wrote it, and she wrote a, an article a long time ago in the Ballard News Tribune that said, my missing link. And she went out in the Lake Washington Ship Canal and rode up and down and says, this, this is where it's at. And you can't really appreciate it from the land side. You have to go out in the water side and understand what's out there and what we, what we can do here for this fleet of vessels that are all independent businesses coming back year by year. Well, we'll definitely touch more on Missing Link. I know that's a topic that um, there's a lot of perspectives in the community. So we'll, we'll definitely uh, touch on that. But does anyone else want to comment about Ballard a little bit? Yeah, I, I can a little bit. As Warren said, you have a lot of uh, these shipyards and everything right there. But the, the greatest part about Ballard is for us is we're storing our vessels in fresh water. Um, salt water is the animal or the enemy to uh, any marine operator. And uh, it gives us the ability to keep our vessels in a calm, controlled environment where we can perform the maintenance versus if we're downtown Seattle dealing with the swells and the boats going up and down and the salt water in the air. Um, when you talk about doing marine maintenance, um, the atmosphere is key for us. And then it's, it's having all these uh, manufacturers and everybody's so close. Um, if we were in Everett, we would be taking running parts back and forth to Seattle all the time where everything is really within a couple miles of our facilities here in Ballard, which is great. It, what's so interesting is that what you point out is that it's really an ecosystem that's evolved around that business. And now it's, it's so deep with um, different people running different pieces of the whole ecology of the business that, you know, that you can get all those parts, get all that stuff close at proximity in a freshwater environment. You know, it's, it's interesting that it kind of just wound up that way. Now, I guess the critical thing is to, to find some ways to make sure we keep it. Yeah, it's truly the, the kind of the Amazon of the marine world. Mm, um, you, you look at a, a lot of other places, you have to wait days and hours to get parts where in, in Ballard you can get things within 20, 30 minutes if you need it. Fisheries, all these businesses are so close. And uh, in, our, in our industry, time is money. Uh, faster, quicker you can get things going. It, it makes a big difference. Yeah, for sure. Others, Sarah, Stephanie, you want to weigh in on that at all? Well, I, I was actually going to say exactly what, what uh, Russell just said. So I, I think that has really captured, captured it from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, we were also curious to um, just talk a little bit more about uh, COVID, about the pandemic and, you know, current impacts and how things are, you know, looking um, as we hopefully are moving into a um, little bit healthier phase for everyone. But I was curious, are there some aspects that have just kept humming along without being interrupted very much? Or is everyone in all of the jobs and all the different sectors been impacted across the board? So just curious to get some 
I mean, right. you think about businesses like Pacific Fishermen and Western Hobo, I mean, there's such frontline businesses where it's really hard to maintain any of this kind of physical distancing stuff. Really interested in how you guys have dealt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Doug, do you want to jump in there? Let me make sure he's on mute. Oh, there you go. I'll unmute him if he had. There we go. I can only ask you to unmute, Doug. You have to unmute yourself. Unmute. Okay, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Well, we, uh, from day one of COVID, um, we put in all the suggested protocol before they were uh, mandatory because uh, we service the seafood harvesting sector, the, um, the, um, um, uh, the public transit sector. Uh, we had the fireboat in during the COVID and the fireboat now uh, during uh, COVID and, and all these things couldn't stop. So we had to, we had to make sure that uh, from day one, our guys were masked up uh, because they couldn't uh, avoid being uh, 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 further apart than a few feet to do their work. And we were very successful for the year without any transmittals so, of COVID-19. So uh, if you just work at it, uh, and we did, uh, because we are essential, we just had to do that. It was, it was just mandatory. Uh, certain things can't stop. Uh, and just like the, the grocery stores, they can't stop. They just got to go. And we did it. Yeah, I can jump in. I mean, it, it was a, it's been a crazy year for us. Uh, our service, <laughs> we're, Southeast Alaska relies on pretty much all of their freight coming from the barges we tow. And uh, we had to really uh, sit down talk to everybody and, and make them understand that this virus, well, one, we're the most susceptible. We're on a small 95, 105 foot tugboat with six people sharing a small, I mean, you're about a maybe 900 square feet <laughs> and you're living together for weeks at a time. So the biggest part for us was your off time. When you're not on that boat, you have to respect the other people that are working with you. Um, and these people, the younger generation, uh, when they get off the boat, they want to go hang out with their friends, but they may be working with an older guy that's more susceptible to the virus. And it, it really came down to, um, us pressuring everybody to really have the respect for their shipmates and everybody else they work with and take into consideration that what they do outside of their job and the workplace has the potential to affect everybody. And, uh, couldn't be more proud than our people and we we got through this so far very uh very minimal things I and mean, we had a one captain his wife was a nurse that got covid at a hospital and he was luckily off the boat and we were extremely lucky knocking on wood and where i think what 70 percent of our employees now are on their have got their first or maybe even their second vaccine now um through clinics such as the discovery health a local company that came to our office and uh we're uh we're, we're getting really lucky now that we're getting everybody vaccine. And I think we're starting to see this trend where every, everybody's still very cautious and we have travel protocols just like everybody else, but we're starting to kind of breathe a little bit more and not sit on the edge of our seats. Yeah. We're getting close to having to be able to sigh a little bit. I think did you, were you yeah. able to quick follow up and I'll certainly let you guys talk. I just wondering have you been able, and I want to know this from all of you, have you been able to use testing of, of folks for COVID during the time you've been trying to deal with this? And how has that gone? If so, have you been able to get testing done or has it been a hard challenge to get the testing? I'll speak for a second here because uh, we, uh, if you remember a year ago uh, now, we were just about to go into the Alaska fishing season. And at that point in time, we, um, didn't, there was certainly concern from communities in Alaska what was going to happen if uh, there was questions whether the fishing season would even, the salmon season would even occur in Alaska. And so the, the company that uh, Russell referred to, Discovery Health, actually set up testing facilities at Fisherman's Terminal. And the independent fishers, they self-organized really. This wasn't a government mandate. They organized, the fishers were tested, quarantined. And there was, it wasn't that there was no COVID at all, but it was all very well maintained. Um, contained. 
There was no community spread, spread to communities in Alaska. So it wasn't a great season from a salmon perspective, but in terms of how the industry responded, it was actually, I would say quite effective. And I will just say from the Port of Seattle on the COVID side, it's been very interesting because we have some of us like myself who are able to work at home and we do, but we're continuing to operate Fisherman's Terminal, Shoal Shoal, uh, Terminal 91, which serves the larger fishing vessels, all uh, fully operational throughout the entire time. Folks are on site doing that work. So we figured out the protocols for obviously everyone's masks, um, you know, social distance, et cetera. We figured out how to do some things at home. Our maintenance crew dispatches from home via cell phone now. But the folks actually doing the maintenance are actually even busier than ever. We've had to increase, for instance, our um, restroom facility cleaning because at all the public parks, um, given the homeless population, more used than ever, and we need to keep those facilities available. Uh, so uh, it's had a, just a huge impact, and it's not even like some jobs are less busy and some people are way more busy. Right. So with way more to do. So it's been a super interesting. And now actually the testing that um, we talked about before is, is a pivoting to vaccination. So we've got vaccination clinics set up at Terminal 91. There's also one at, at the airport. And just interesting to know that firm that's doing the, so much of that testing and vaccination was in the first cohort of the Maritime Accelerator. So that was actually a firm that had gone through that accelerator and gotten resources to expand. And then when the pandemic came, was really able to provide those services that people needed. Wow, fantastic. If I, if I might add, uh, as far as uh, COVID, with the employees that we had, they had to social distance and everything. But ironically, it was a great advantage because Prior to the, well, in the, via, the old viaduct days, we could turn a Harbor Island trip down to Harbor Island, load and get back for fuel because all our fuel has to come from Harbor Island. And there's only three facilities in the city of Seattle that have fixed facilities that fuel these boats. And Kovic and Williams and us on the canal, we have to come from Harbor Island with that fuel. It used to be you could turn it in an hour. Well, prior to COVID, it was getting to be an hour and a half or two hours to make that turn. And during COVID, we got back down to an hour, an hour and 15 minutes because we're relegated to using the waterfront now. And uh, ironically, now it's starting to pick up again with the amount of traffic and congestion. So we're back into hour and three quarters to two hours to make a load. So ironically, it worked out really well for us for a, a good period of time. And the only thing that affected us is probably more of effect was the, uh, the closure of the locks for the 50 days uh, during the two fishing seasons and the last so the three closures, and thank God we got the one last closure closed down and we didn't have to do that. So we've suffered through all that in COVID. I think things will just go forward better, but I think it's going to just take us longer on the transportation side as it continues. Yeah, that's definitely was one of the funny little weird silver linings. I had a big construction project going on out rurally myself, and it's like suddenly you could get there without having to sit in traffic. Um Fantastic. I, I, you know, it's just, it illustrates one more place where um, the folks in Ballard owe yet another further debt to how, how much you folks have done at different places in the, in the work you do to um, really preserve the, the um, health and safety of folks and, and keep the economy going all at the same time as all this going on. So kudos to you. Another question for the panel, Angie? Brent, yeah, Brent, I'm, we had a little list of five. I'm actually going to skip number three because I feel like we touched on that a bit and I can You're see some good, uh, good other community questions coming in. So let's jump to, um, so the city has a current industrial maritime advisory process that's underway. And we were curious to ask what you um, as a panel hope will be some of the most significant outcomes for Ballard specifically as that process moves forward. What can the community and um, range of businesses in Ballard hope to, um, to see come out of that advisory process that's underway? I guess that's me, right? Well, well it's, yeah, <laughs> it's anyone, but definitely, yeah. <laughs> you, you um, would well, certainly play a critical role with it. <laughs> yeah, we're in the last, finally, we're in the last uh, few meetings. Russell and Warren are a part of that group as well. Um, I think from a land use perspective, um, 
what I think we're going to see is more protection of the maritime and industrial, um, like the, the area that's zoned hardcore maritime and industrial, which is called IG1 and IG2. Um, I think we're going to find stronger protections in that area. So things like big box stores and storage facilities and the kind of loopholes that were um, available where some of these things got into the industrial area. So I think we're gonna see those protections. Um, there's some changes that might come about in terms of the transition in the buffer zones. So as we move out towards where the kind of where the industrial area bumps up against um, residential. Um, there's some transition zones and maybe making um, some zoning that would be more helpful to businesses like uh, rad bikes where they do light core or, you know, light industrial where they could have some offices above that would support like with engineering or design or those kind of things. And then um, not so much in Ballard, but particularly in other places in the city, um, a third zone, which would have very limited um, housing ability in those areas, but it would be restricted to um, the current zoning, which allows for caretakers quarters and some artist quarters, but being very careful to make sure that there are not loopholes where we get, oh, this is an artist loft. And then you get the problems that Warren was talking about earlier, where, you know, you've got the noise ordinance and the smell and these folks that move into these industrial areas and think, oh, this is going to be really cool. And then it's loud and smelly sometimes. Um, and that makes it really challenging to, to maintain that industrial space when they're trying to do their jobs and people are trying to live right next to it. So hopefully some protections for the residential folks so that you know, there's a little bit of those delineations of zones where they're gonna do hardcore um, industrial. From a public safety perspective, um, I honestly, even though I'm a city employee, I, I can't really, they're holding that really close to their chest, chest in other places. And, you know, it's such a complicated issue. Um, and there are other stakeholder groups where, um, you know, they're trying to figure that out. Now, I do wanna tell you that in terms of Ballard, uh, Mike Stewart and the Ballard Alliance has been, um, he and the other business improvement areas have really been um, speaking up and being very upset with the city and saying, we need change right here and right now. So he is, the next time you see Mike Stewart, give him a pat on the back and say thank you because he's he has really been um, protecting and doing his job in terms of Ballard Alliance uh, for public safety. Yeah, Mike's uh, a good friend of the Ballard District Council, and we certainly do thank him for representing that perspective a lot. I mean, I think, you know, the one most frequent thing we hear in the Ballard District Council by email and by folks just talking to us Ballard Market or QFC is, you know, when and how is it going to get better? When are we going to find mm -hmm. some way to deal with the homelessness crisis, with the public safety threats, with property yeah. crime that's going on, especially yeah. down in industrial Ballard where some of the crime has become, you know, even kind of bordering on pretty violent crime at times. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the message of the, the BIA is, which includes Mike, um, has been that, you know, the, the homeless issue is an issue, but now because of lack of policing or the reduction of policing, there is active, organized criminal behavior and activity that has to be dealt with. So that's the message that, that he's been giving me. That's the message that I've been passing on to the city. Um, and there are other stakeholder groups that they're really going to start working on that, um, more actively, but it's it's super challenging. In terms of workforce, um, there's lots of, you know, my, so I don't officially, um, I'm not officially a workforce development person, but because of where I came from, 
that is certainly a focus of what um, I'm trying to support. And so I work very closely with our workforce development team. We have someone who does youth specifically, and we have some, someone who does um, adults specifically. And so I think you'll see some, some cool changes coming out of that. If, if nothing else, I think more coordination. There's a lot of people doing a lot of cool things around youth and maritime, but we need to be coordinating more. Um, and you know, if the port's doing something, then we don't need to do it. We need to support them and make sure or jump on board with them or vice versa. So I'm hoping, you know, that's one of the things that I see um, my job as coming from the maritime industry and advocating for the maritime industry is making sure that the city is working with the port and where they're not and where they should be. I highlight that and make sure that those, those things are brought out. Um, what else? Transportation, there's lots of transportation issues. Obviously the sound transit is a huge issue and everything has gotten stalled. Um, they are trying to figure out where they're gonna go from there. Um, the, in this maritime and industrial strategy, the message that Ballard wants a tunnel is loud and clear, um, at least from the, uh, the industrial folks. And so we will pass that on for sure. Um, it is loud and clear that freight movement is incredibly important and that if we can't get our freight from Ballard to the, the main port um, in South Seattle and I-5, that's a problem. So all of those messages are loud and clear. Now, what Seattle Department of Transportation is gonna do about that, um, that remains to be seen, but we yeah. have great representation like Warren on the freight advisory board that we just keep hammering away until things change. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it, things have changed a great deal. You're, you're certainly very right about that last point. Um, just put in a quick plug before I kind of try and segue to some other folks sure. here for our next month's meeting, which we hope to uh, be focused on some of the regional transportation stuff that you just alluded to. Um, guests that we've been mentioning and, and folks from the agencies that we've just been talking about and try and focus in a little bit on the routing of, of sound transit, focus in a little bit on the um, the BIRT study, the regional transportation study that's kind of gone on down there. and. Um, Interbay and Ballard and try and get after some of that next month. So those of you who are watching, joining tonight, please join us again next month for that. Fellas, um, Doug, Russ, Lauren, I'm interested in sort of hearing from you guys a little bit on some of that um, Seattle Maritime uh, strategy and initiative. Um, I heard Sarah say, you know, they're really trying to listen and make some changes that can make improvements with zoning and land use and protecting some of the uses in, in kind of a planning sense, but I also hear her saying that they're really struggling to know what to do at all with the really loud chorus of voices talking about public safety. Um, and I, I certainly don't feel like we've been hearing as a stakeholders to some of that, hearing much from um, the city council that would give us confidence that it's really coming to the fore to be addressed. So uh, if, what do you guys have to say? How's it affecting you? Warren, why don't you start? Yeah, uh, I think one of the things that is is happening, and I, and you'll notice that the shoreline confines are within 200 feet of the shoreline, and in places here, especially uh, between Ballard, uh, Ballard Oil, Pacific Fisherman, Stabbert Marine, that 200 feet is actually just up onto the railroad tracks, and so. And Warren, I'm just going to interrupt you real quick to say that we should mention for those who don't know what you're talking about is the shoreline master program and the. Shoreline Management Act that basically designates a 200 feet from the water's edges shoreline of the state. Okay, yeah, that, there just doesn't seem to be currently enough protections in there uh, when you can put housing right against the industrial area. We talked earlier, I talked about noise ordinance, which is at the property line and the transportation quarters, the railroad right of way, which is back behind here is rail bank railroad right of way. And in some places uh, now, the current design behind Ballard Yards, which is the old Ballard transfer property with 170 housing units, uh, the roadway, which has to service all the industrial area uh, down here is in some cases less than 15 feet wide. And that's got to accommodate double truck and trailers going through there all the time. So we need to make sure that those shoreline protections for the maritime side that's on shoreline 
is actually protected and this can't happen in other places because if we start not protecting it, then obviously it's going to have to be compromised and leave. So I think that's one of the issues. And as far as the transportation, uh, there's a lot of great people in, in SDOT and I'll say that, but I don't think, in fact, I'm almost certain unless I've taken them for a ride, most of the people in SDOT don't even know what it's like to be in the side of a cab of a truck, what you can see and what you can't see. And you talk about unsafe situations. There's so many times that you get in a place that uh, you can't see anybody and people believe you can see them. And so it puts them in an unsafe condition. And uh, we saw the results of that consistently with uh, people being injured or killed on uh, bikes. And I'm sure it's going to happen with scooters now, being the fact that they can't be on the sidewalk, they have to be on the road. So I think that we really need to look to see how to protect people that are unaware they're in harm's way because they don't understand what the other side is doing. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, I'd have to uh, uh, say that that our border uh, with the uh, apartments that are going up on um, on uh, Market Street is is uh, we've learned to work with them, and we've worked with the um, the the designers of it to mitigate um, sound and light relative to uh, the windows that face us. They have no problem working with us. In the 20 years that I've been working at Pacific Fishman, there's only been one noise complaint and one light complaint. The noise complaint was mitigated right away. And yes, we were violating the ordinance. Uh, I mean, it just it's just a fact of life. And so, you know, you can't go and violate an ordinance and, and expect not to, to have some issues. So we just don't violate the ordinance anymore. And we've worked successfully for those 20 years. Uh, relative to the uh, light, the one light complaint uh, turned out to be a, uh, a city of Seattle streetlight uh, with, that was uh, oriented incorrectly and uh, it just had to be tilted rightly. So uh, we've been working quite well with the uh, developments of the properties along Market Street. We think it's a, a boon to the city to have that developed properly and to give people a place to stay, work, eat. And it's, it's a thing that attracts the crews. We want a nice Market Street. And the fact that it borders a railroad, we have no problem working uh, with uh, those people along there. And uh, 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 so, so we really welcome the, the, the mixed use of Ballard. It's one of the attractions and what makes our industrial uh, sector uh, so nice is that we have uh, a mix and we work well with that mix. Yeah, that's really well said. I think that in the, in the past, you could probably argue that folks would be here because it was sort of one of the more economically affordable options for, for doing that. But now when you're talking about it, you're really talking about folks who are choosing to be here versus choosing to be in the university district or in West Seattle or down in um, the newly renamed Lower Queen Anne Uptown neighborhood, um, where you kind of have the same kind of housing pressures and economic conditions that make it difficult to afford. And yet people are really actually choosing to be right next to the industrial piece, which is, is really cool. Russell, did you want to say something? Yeah, it's a, it's it's kind of a tough tough deal because I look at our shipyard and our, our employees, and I'd say eighty five percent of them don't live in Seattle. They can't afford it, yeah. um, or they don't choose not to. Uh, the boat guys like to live in the country, and they because they're gone for longer. But our shipyard guys, I mean, a lot of them are in the North Sound, Everett, Arlington, and commute down. But the, uh, the freight mobility is huge for us. Uh, like Warren said, um, we have trucks coming and going all the time, bringing steel and supplies for what we have going on uh, at our shipyard. And that part of it um, can be tricky at times with the, all the construction projects and then the changes to the roadways um, and timing. Uh, like Warren said, uh, we rely on fuel trucks to come to our yard and they're sometimes delayed, which can delay a vessel. Uh, th th that's kind of the things that worry us. We're, we're not so um, plagued by the residential issues where we are, we're next to Brown Bear. So we don't have a ton and, and we don't work 24 hours a day. We're pretty much a 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. type of a business. So th that, that side of things has never been a real big issue for Western Tobo, but the freight mobility and ensuring that we can get what we need is our, our biggest thing. I probably should recognize that we've got about 25 minutes left. I want to be sure. And we 
get yeah. questions in and maybe give folks who are attending the meeting a chance to raise their hand and ask some questions too. So Angie, I'll stop. Brent, I, I was going to suggest that. Take. Yeah. The one other topic we really wanted to make sure to touch on was the Ship Canal Water Quality Project and the use of 24th Avenue Northwest, the pier and um, kind of public land in that area as that um, the water quality project comes to completion. So that's one topic, Brent, but then there's been yeah, some- Yeah, I think great... we definitely want to touch on that. Yeah. Well, I, and... I definitely could say that the water quality project is not coming to completion, although we have finally named the tube the tunnel cutting machine, but no, I'm sorry. I don't mean that the project's coming to completion, but talking about public use of it after oh. it comes to completion, there's a lot right, of people wanting right. to talk about that now. Yeah, there's a bunch um, of folks that are interested in that, and they've certainly contacted us and me to talk about that, and um, have been interested to hear what Doug's perspective is on kind of how things go right next door there, where Seattle Public Utilities is kind of putting their pump station, and someday is going to have a decision to make about the waterfront and whether people can access down there or not. Um, I, yeah, what what do you guys have to say about that? I, maybe there was a question in there and I ruined it, Angie, you wanna continue? No, that, no, that's, I think we can just kind of keep, keep blazing ahead, um, but to see if anyone has opinions about public uses of that area down there. I'm not sure if Doug Dixon is still- uh, Yeah, Doug's driving along. Too long. <laughs> <I'm there. laughs> I was guessing he might have the first opinion on that one, but- yeah. Well, no, I, I, I'm here and we've been using it for uh, 150 years um, and we uh, use that street end um, to access uh, the vessels from uh, the, the public side. And at the very end is, is uh, one of our driveways that have to be clip, uh, kept clear for freight mobility. And, uh, but we have no uh, a problem. The, the kayaks have been there in the past. They're, they've been kind of uh, out recently because of the the, the big dig there, but I'm sure when that um, is done that the, the kayaks will come back and go in and out of the, the street end there without issue, but we still need our, without issue, our access uh, to our uh, shipyard facility. And uh, the public pier is a, is a combined use pier between Pacific fishermen and the city. And we need, uh, it's an industrial style pier and uh, it needs to remain that. Um, the um, the center itself, the, the, the drilling station, uh, one third will remain uh, with the SPU for servicing their, um, their um, pump station and the pump station. The other two thirds, uh, uh, we think the best use is maritime industrial. And the, uh, we're working with the Port of Seattle to, uh, to affect a purchase of that uh, from, um, from the city when it is surplused. So that it, that might be an one interesting more. topic, Brent, to um one more. Okay. to bring up at another meeting um, when things are just a little bit further along. So I think there's a lot more we could explore there, but I don't want to do it at the expense of uh, missing out on some other topics tonight. So fair enough, fair enough. Um, so with that, I know we had one question that came in regarding the missing link, and then I can see some other community questions here. But Brent, do you want to um? Do you have the question that came in from Dave regarding the missing link? Uh, I can grab it or if you have it. Let's see here. No, I can't. Yep, I've got it right here. So let's see. A question that we wanted to ask was um, the missing link has been in the news um, quite a bit lately um, because of the where the current lawsuit um, and uh, city determination around that has been. But a question is, uh, let's see, for those who were part of the compromise agreement with uh, former Mayor Murray to move forward with the Burt Gilman missing link along Shilshul and Market, do you still support that commitment? So is that phrased clearly enough that there was a um, kind of a compromise agreement for the portion of the trail from 24th Avenue heading westward? Not not, uh, not on Shilshul, that was a misunderstanding. and. Okay. and some uh, people were confused. Uh, that's not the case. The, the only safe place to put it is on Larry, period. What? Well, well, I, I understood there to have been a broker kind of deal that was part of the FI, FEIS. Before. No, there was no broker deal. There was no broker deal. I was never consulted on that deal. I was never part of that deal and it was not a deal and it was not right. And, and only one person who was confused uh, uh, made an allusion to agreeing with it. So uh, you need to go back on okay. history on that one. I guys. think it, I remember there was an occasion where former council member O'Brien and uh, former mayor Murray met down near the Ballard locks and talked about a compromise agreement that had come up. One, and I think that's what 
Right. And I, w I was never aware of that meeting. I was I heard it about it on the news. And when I saw it, I was flabbergasted, as were the other people of the coalition. There was only one person there uh, that was uh, 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 ostensibly uh, um, uh, representing us. And he okay. was confused. Well, it sounds Warren, like there's... do you have anything to add to that conversation? And then we'll just leave it. Yeah, if you uh, followed the whole process, uh, we kept on trying to find a solution that would work. And at the end, uh, at the very end, after it came to pass that there was no solution, I resigned from the, the uh, group and said that uh, I would not be a party to a design that could not make it safe so people don't have to die to prove it isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And the more I look at it and the more I see what's going on, uh, I just don't see how there can be any design that does not protect the bicycles and the pedestrians when they get down into a heavy industrial area, when the truck drivers that drive the equipment that we, can, that we drive can't see them and don't know that they're in harm's way. And the people that are in harm's way, like I say, I have a great video that, that I could play that just shows you what you really can't see. And there's so much you cannot see. As long as you're going straight lines or you know that you have the right of way, it works. But if it doesn't and uh, the unknowing public that gets in those areas um, would just be in harm's way. And I, I just couldn't be a part of it. So, uh, I mean, wherever it goes, it, it doesn't matter. It just has to be such a thing that the public recognizes or is controlled so that they don't have to be injured to find out that it isn't working. So the design just didn't work and that's all there is to it. And that's why I, I resigned. Uh, we tried to find a compromise to try to find something to work. Um, and no matter what you did, it still came out to the problem that it was unsafe. So that, that's all I have to say. Um, I think one of the most common things I hear in the community in general is um, people, especially, you know, who are strong bicycle proponents, but just people in general, um, knowing that the trail goes through industrial areas in Fremont and other parts of, you know, the city and the region. What is it that's so unique about Shulshul Avenue and Ballard that makes it so difficult to design the trail in that area? I, I think, uh, to be honest with you, the, the, the properties are so narrow and the trucks are so concentrated at the places where they do go, do go in and out. That becomes the 24th, the 26th, that becomes uh, uh, Salmon Bay, Sand and Gravel, becomes Kovich and Williams, becomes uh, uh, CSR Marine, all those places that have heavy, heavy traffic movement and the inability to stop and hold the people when they need to be held. If there was crossing arms and they could put gates in there and we could have people uh, respect those things. Uh, I mean, in, if you go down Second Avenue, you see the traffic lights and you see them stopping, stopping bicyclists when people are turning or when they have to turn and everybody is controlled. That whole trail is a lack of controls uh, in this industrial area. And the, the rest of that industrial area is nothing like this because this is so close to the waterfront and there's no place to turn around. There's no places to come out. You have, like I say, a lack of sight distances. I got some really good pictures and I, I wish I could bring them up and show everybody, but I just, I just know what's going to happen. And so I'm not willing to accept that as a solution. I think it has to be safe. If the public really wants to come down in that area, they can come down anytime they want, but we surely can't handle, I think the original Burke Gilman Trail, the, the bicycle community said they anticipated 2000 people a day. That's a lot of crossings. And with the, if you ever sat in the cab of a truck and tried to see what you need to see, you realize that it's impossible. So it just is going to be a, a very unsafe situation. You could make it safe. If they put the controls in, you could make it safe. But the choice was, is nobody wants to be controlled. They're willing to take their chances. And I think that's just not the right way to design it. Yeah, thank you, Warren. I don't want to spend too much longer talking about that topic, mm -hmm. but I did want to ask Sarah real quick what the role of OED might be in, in pursuing the next phase of that policy issue. That is a very good question. Yeah, but you're wondering, okay. <laughs> Um, well, I haven't, best, I will include you. yeah, I haven't been involved in the previous part. Um, we were waiting for this, um, this court case to go through and now that it has, and they have to go through and do the EIS again. Um, I imagine that we'll all OED and myself will be more involved. Well, and we're going to have a new mayor, so we're probably not going to see a lot of movement on that until we have a whole nother executive 
side we'll, going forward. Yeah. So, so Brent, with that, I see other questions that came up in the chat, but I'm wondering if there's anyone attending who wants to be able to raise their hand. Do you need to promote them to be panelists? I can or? turn their mic on so they can ask and yeah, potentially We've promote got, them. Yeah, close I to. I think folks have a raise their hand button. I'm not sure. This is where it gets a little bit out of my expertise, but. Um, Do you want me to pull a question from chat, or should we sure. wait just a second? I, mean, I, I don't know if somebody could raise their hand or not. So <laughs> I feel like they can't. I feel like you need to promote people before they'll be able to. Okay. Well, rather than just promoting um, all everybody on the panelists or on the attendance side, um, let's just maybe pull from a question in the uh, chat, and you can okay ask somebody to join in. Great. So they so maybe that's a way if people within the chat want to say if they'd like to ask their questions, should we ask people to do that, Brent? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So if anyone would prefer to ask their own question, if you can put a little note in chat and Brent will promote you um, to the right status so that you're able to uh, turn on your video and join us. Um, and I will ask a question in the meantime here. Um, so there was one more sound transit question that came in. Let me check. Um, asking if anyone has insights with the failing revenue forecast for sound transit, how will that change its impact on the maritime business? I don't know if we feel like we covered that enough for the moment or if anyone has additional comments about sound transit's uh, revenue forecast and local impacts. Anyone want to jump in on Somebody that? Somebody successfully raised their hand. It was Jody. Should we skip past the sound transit? Sure. Okay. Jody has a question. Why don't we okay. promote Jody and she can ask a question? Jody Grage, board member of Bower District Council. You should be able to be seen and heard from Jody. I just wanted to say that I was. Um, uh in the other pool and i was able to raise my hand <laughs> okay thank you and you couldn't tell that because you weren't in there so i just no, and I to... can, we have 24 participants and i don't have the ability to see who's raising their hand or not i do so. okay ah so, so, so i saw I'm... jody's hand go up so if there's a raise your hand button and somebody wants to ask a question please do okay, so. okay. got that cleared up where'd Excellent. you find the button jody well, one okay. So Jody, it do you have down, a question also? No, I don't. Okay. But I, I just wanted to let you know that that process was working. The raise hand button was down on the on the low the menu at the bottom of the um, of the uh, the pictures. Thank you. All but right. I, so I don't see. It. No, wait a sec. I don't. See it now, on the bottom I of the participants. It it's on the bottom of the participants laid label. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and pull another question right. out of the chat then. And this question is, do any of the speakers have comments on BIRT, B-I-R-T, which is the transportation study that was run by SDOT and it was sent to the Washington State Legislature late last year. Does anyone wanna comment? It's the uh, Ballard Interbay Regional Transportation Study. I'd like to just throw one thing out that you have to remember that the waterfront 15th Elliott Corridor Ballard is the only major truck street in the city of Seattle that goes from the north end to the south end. All the rest of them are compromised. The, the major uh, 99 and I-5 obviously are not city streets, but the only city street is that one street. So it is hopefully going to be protected in all this to allow the continuation of freight mobility when everything else fails. That's a fair comment. Does anyone else have comments on the BIRT, the B-I-R-T? I think we might try to dig into this um, a little more next month. Yeah, it'll be central next month for sure. Okay. And let's see here, one question, which Stephanie, I see that you helped address in the chat, but I'm just gonna um, raise it so everyone else can hear it, was that um, a thank you to the Port of Seattle for keeping public restrooms clean and open. And the question is, given the unhoused population, is there any talk of adding more public restrooms, including to locations that border the Ballard industrial area? 
And do you mind, Stephanie, do you mind re-answering that one? Yeah, that you, sure. I, 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 um, I'm happy to. Thanks. Uh, so we have actually increased the amount of cleaning that, that uh, we've done in the bathrooms and in some cases kept them open for longer. They I, are super expensive to build. Bathrooms are, unfortunately, especially to make them durable. Uh, so we are not um, anticipating building more. And I will also just say back to the original question, uh, just to put this into context for people, the folks who clean our bathrooms at the port, they are, uh, are some of the most, uh, they're probably, they're not on the highest end of the pay scale. They're folks who don't often speak English as a first language. Uh, and they're really out on the front lines and we ask them to not only keep doing their job, but to be doing it more frequently. And if you think back to um, a little more of a year ago when this started, we didn't know all the things we know now about keeping safe. So I think it was a really, um, uh, you know, they really felt like they were on the front lines and they were. We're in a different place today and folks have been able to be vaccinated and everything. So I want to, I say that to kind of give a shout out to and recognize uh, those folks who have been keeping those facilities clean that whole time. But we're not building more. Well, thank you for doing all you're doing to keep them operational in the meantime. We're kind of coming down to our last eight or 10 minutes now. I kind of want to try and touch on some looks ahead um, a little bit and hear from you folks sort of what do you think is the, um, how will I word this? I'm just kind of curious to hear what, what you know, what's the biggest challenge that lies ahead? What's the, what's the future look like? From your perspective, for your business, for your interactions, what are the things you're really hoping? Once we can put all this COVID and current sort of temporal stuff behind us, what's what's your hope that's going to happen over the next five years? And and maybe hear a little bit if if there's a relationship uh, from what Stephanie thinks uh, you know some of her innovation center stuff can do to try and address that. Well, I can uh, start here if you want. Start. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah. From, from our standpoint, um, our hope that we is that we continue to see a skilled uh, workforce and um, labor, more of it and more training uh, and access to these people that uh, are able to do the jobs that we need as far as uh, machinists, electricians, uh, engineers. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to find good people and people with the knowledge that we're looking for as a, in our industry. Uh, the other part of that is the regulations. Um, we, we don't want our business to become harder to operate. We want to continue building boats and um, sourcing items from local businesses in Ballard. Um, so as long as we can keep doing that, we're going to be in a good shape. So uh, I hear you saying that business is really pretty good. You just oh yeah. need to keep being able to, to grow and accommodate the demand. Absolutely. Yeah. No, we want to keep building boats and the, uh, business has been really good for us. We've been staying steady and able to keep up and uh, keeping everybody working is always the number one priority for us. Well, it certainly helps everyone who lives here in Ballard. Anybody can I, else? Can Sorry? I just interject one thing um, to tag on to that? I'm curious if any of you have advice or um, ideas, if there's people you know in the Ballard area or who are tuning in who've been really impacted in their jobs and maybe are thinking about career transitions or maybe hadn't really been. Um, and and could be, what are some ways that people can learn about different decent paying steady jobs? Is it to look through the community college system? Is it to look at the Maritime Academy? Is it to just be contacting and, you know, connecting with community in Ballard and asking around? What are some ways that people can learn about all the things that are going on? I can't see you. Keep going straight. Um, Sarah probably be the best. I mean, Seattle Maritime's great. Um, Renton Technical College, uh, welding, stuff like that. And uh, I know businesses like Vigor in Seattle have uh, done the like a school internship type deal. Um, and it, it's out there. You have to seek a little bit for it. And then there's private private um, industry too. So you have Pacific Maritime Institute, Compass Courses in Edmonds for the maritime side. Um, but we're really, you're, you're seeing a lot of uh, the tug companies pull people from the Seattle Maritime Academy right now because it's entry level. And as a business owner, operator, what we like is we can grab somebody that's new but has a really good platform for a foundation to start their career. And then you can kind of train them the way you expect them to operate within your organization and 
um, they kind of, instead of someone that was maybe did something one way at another place and has been doing it for 20 years, you can really kind of work with these people from the ground up and help set their roots in the way that you operate your business. And that's been really the core of what has made our business great is because we have a group of people that have come up through our ranks, starting at the bottom to captain that kind of learn the way we do things. We run a really tight, clean ship and other companies are a little different operation, but if we can start that mentality at the beginning, instead of trying to teach an old dog, new tricks that helps sometimes. Um, if that makes sense. I mean, yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> try and train the puppies right from the beginning. That's yeah. So, <laughs> and, um, it's it, it just, and it comes down to your, uh, your core values as a, as a company too. I mean, everybody has a different vision and a goal and, um, being able to start from the beginning is really helpful for a lot of people. Warren, okay. did and you have something I, to say? Yeah, John, I see no, you, but I'm going to add something just... in real quick first and then Sarah. Okay. Was that me? Yeah, that's you. Yeah, oh, okay. About... There was a lot of discussion. There. Uh, I, I think this workforce development, I think one of the things that has to happen is the Seattle School District has to have more of a buy in to training in the high school uh, for the kids that aren't making it. Uh, and it's being difficult for them to go. Once they find one of those trades that they like, they can excel at it by getting to Maritime Academy or some of those places to actually move them on. But we're losing way too many kids uh, out of school that just don't find it able to continue on. I've got a grandson that did that. And uh, after he went through all the things he's done, he's bought a boat and he's going fishing and he's mm -hmm. making really good wages. So I think those opportunities have to happen in the Seattle School District. I mean, after all, the majority of the Maritime is right here in Seattle yet there's a lack of, uh, of that education in the schools. Uh, they do some stuff for aviation down in Rainier Beach, but uh, all the schools could be running some kind of a program, whether it be the Highline School District program or Core Plus or one of those. And the other thing obviously is transportation that we have to make sure the transportation corridors are kept open, viable, many people on buses as possible. I know you're gonna listen to me when I say as many people on bikes, but in safe predicted areas that we know what's happening and we keep them safe. So yep. I there you go, that. Sarah. Uh, um, well, I was just gonna add to Russell that, you know, when I was the Dean of uh, the Seattle Maritime Academy, I made sure and gave you the- uh, Unmute it for you. The uh, top I'll students so I could get you hooked. And so See, now you're hooked. Across there. So, um, but I, uh, and then I it threw. Then I can't remember what else I was going to say. But workforce, yes. Um, oh, the Seattle School District. Um, they do have skill center programs, but it's a matter of getting young people to know that they exist, that they can get involved, that if they are struggling with school and they like working with their hands. I mean, there was a great number of examples. Um, and I'm not sure if he ended up working for Western Tobo, but there's a young man the last year that I was at, or the last six months that I was at the school, that he had a learning disability. He wasn't able to like take tests or whatever, but sharp as a tack. And you could ask him to do anything with his hands. He remembered it. If he saw it and he did it, he remembered it. He was respectful. He was on time. He wore the right clothes. Uh -huh. He like brought the right equipment to the table when he was supposed to. And those are all the things that you need in the maritime industry. So he just didn't have the academic prowess um, and he didn't, he didn't need it. He didn't need um, those yeah, pieces. Different kids with different skills for sure. Yeah. We're running short on time. So I'm gonna jump over and say, Stephanie, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, I was just going to respond to the, the, the question, or less the workforce question, although I would say that remember that maritime companies, in addition to maritime workers, they also need accountants and other things. So the maritime industry has so many different, different jobs um, that are cool and interesting, even if you're not the person so lucky as to be actually out on the water. Uh, you asked before about um, about kind of recovery from COVID. One thing we have not talked about at all today because it's really not centered in Ballard, but uh, the cruise business is a, is a um, you know it's fairly new. Maritime industry has been around for a long time, 
The modern cruise business has only been in Seattle for a little more than 20 years, but it's become a huge part of the economy. So many jobs uh, rely on that. Uh, and uh, I will tell you, uh, it brings a lot of revenue to the port and the community that then supports other things. So when we're actually out doing capital projects to support fishing vessels, the money to support that is coming from crews. So that's restarting that is going to be a super important part of, um, uh, I would say, keeping the maritime um, industry whole in Seattle. And of course, there's a lot of safety protocols that has to restart safely, et cetera. But that's another important thing. We just haven't talked about it today. So I thought I would mention that as well. Yeah, appreciate it. It's it's has become on workforce development. On workforce development. Yeah, the, um, uh, there are so many uh, promising programs with coming up that everyone's working on. And, 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 and one of the ones I like the best is, is that Bigger uh, has a uh, welding training school. And we just have a shortage of welders right now. And, and uh, uh, getting that, uh, more people into that program uh, is, is, is I'm sorry, Doug, we're losing your technology. That's the challenge we're trying to draw in Zoom calls on iPhones sometimes. Um, John, you've been waiting patiently. I'm going to let you ask a question. Yeah, I have a uh, the, part of this question is about how do we advertise to the to the community at large um, the jobs that are available? I mean, I, I hear all you talking about the, the various kind of things and the skills that are there. And we have a lot of people who, who are who are looking for work, but they're looking for work not in your area. And, and how do we do a better job of marketing that? I mean, I come from a background of marketing, so that's why I think those sort of things. But but uh, I was looking to to uh, to you as, a, as as an interesting panel. Is how how do you, how do we do a better job of getting people to your industry? Well, the, the younger people, I think you have to look to the social media platforms, to be honest. And uh, I, I know we're working with uh, the uh, Propeller Club and the, a few of those guys are doing this uh, the Seattle Maritime Week. And they're going to do a few like uh, Zoom interviews and put some things on the Instagram uh, advertisements of uh, maritime jobs and things like that and try and get people, the younger people interested in this kind of industry that we're in and I think that's a good start. And then a, a lot of it in our industry, the tugboat side of it is you see a lot of cousins and brothers and it's, it's a word of mouth. Um, but that's just the problem is that the word of mouth only goes so far in a, in the area that we are, where we have Amazons and all these other things. And so I, I think the social media platforms for the younger people is key. So we, if I could just uh, say one thing, one of the yeah. things that's been interesting during COVID is we've had uh, some of our internships have been virtual and we had a group of um, high school interns and we gave them that assignment. Like, how do we talk to your peers? Because, you know, I'm going to put it on Facebook and who's going to see it, right? Not, not the kids. So, um, and they put together a whole uh, program for, it was a high school intern project for communicating out with, um, with kids their age, especially folks who don't know the maritime industry, who, aren't, who are not the cousins and brothers. And I think that's a key thing. Like we, we know how to talk to each other. If we wanna get people different than us into the industry, we need to be talking to those folks who are different and getting their help. So I think that's a key thing to remember. I think that's right. I would even expand on that and suggest that it's, it's not just talking about folks you want to recruit for workforce development, but it's also just stakeholder connection and community engagement. You know, it's, it's a little surprising and unfortunate that this is one of the few kind of panel discussions like this that's really been happening. And we hopefully will do some more like this. But, um, but it, you know, I'm interested how the port, for example, is really trying to reach out to the communities living around your facilities. Are you trying to use some of those tools, like Russell mentioned, the you know the social media platforms and things, to to try and just even do community awareness building, community interaction. 
it's been a huge, huge focus for us. And it's, it, and it's interesting because it's very different than doing like coming to the Ballard District Council or meeting with Queen Anne when you're working with uh, communities that have a lot more challenges of um, lots of different languages spoken, not having the kind of job where folks can take off and go to a meeting. So it's, it's, uh, it's really, um, it's take it, it, we've had to do it differently, uh, but we actually have now started um, a community, uh, it's called the PCAT, what does that stand for? But in the Duwamish Valley, we have, we have started a community advisory uh, board that we meet with them, we have an agreement, uh, we're implementing a number of different programs and it looks quite different than the agreement we have, for instance, with Queen Anne and Magnolia. Right, but really important in the era of trying to finally catch up a little on race and social justice equity. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I feel like I could keep um, peppering you guys with questions for a long time and we could keep going on. Um, but we also did say we were going to try and end this by about 8.30 and so we're running almost 10 minutes late as per normal when we have these interesting discussions. Um, so I'm just going to wrap it up. I encourage folks who are attending this meeting to tell folks you know about it and let folks know they can still follow up and watch it and catch this information on our YouTube channel from BallardDistrict.org um, is linked. And, uh, and just want to um, thank everyone very much for your time, for your engagement, for the role you're playing in our, um, in our economy and in our community for sure. Um, all of you have this really dynamic and different responsibilities and it's, it's fantastic to have everyone here together at the same time to kind of talk about some of this. Um, undoubtedly, we're going to be hearing um, more as the um, city continues to produce and pursue this maritime strategic uh, sort of uh, program. Um, and I know you'll be working hard on that, Sarah, and, and a bunch of others of you as well as sort of stakeholders and participants in that. Um, encourage all of you um, who were here as attendees or panelists to uh, stay in touch with us. Um, feel free to join our meetings in the future. Um, we're here every month online. We're hoping to be um, both online and in person again before too much longer, but it looks the way things are going like it's still maybe a number of months. Uh, Angie, you wanna add anything? John, you wanna add anything? Other fellow board members? Just want to really thank the panelists and definitely welcome any community feedback. We really, um, really would love to get more ideas from the community, make more connections, and just really welcome however people want to reach out to us, whether it's Facebook, email, in person, you know, whichever way you can help us uh, keep building on things. That would be right. really great. Well said. We'll make our normal pitch that is not too many of us who are really uh, working hard to try and produce these meetings and produce. <laughs> Um, a connection and a network for the community to get together among different um, uh, different organizations, business, nonprofit, schools, people in the neighborhoods. Um, so more volunteer power would result in more power coming back out to everybody. So um, we'd love to hear from you folks, especially those of you with energy. And uh, with that, I guess I'll just say um, to everybody, panelists, thank you very much. And to everyone on the call, um, Enjoy what looks like it might be 70 for the first time in the next couple of days. And uh, don't get stuck in front of uh, only all Zoom calls all day long like we all are right now. But thank you very much again. And, um, and we'll see you all again on the second Wednesday of May. Uh, we're hoping to talk about um, regional transportation and transportation planning, um, a bunch of issues uh, in Ballard. Uh, Warren, Sarah, Doug, Russell, and Stephanie, appreciate your time. Hey, thank you. From Bauer District Council, we're saying good